Order in the church. Order in the church. My name is Judge J Dub. I want to welcome you here today. If you're joining us in the Mount Pleasant precinct, we've got a special case in store for each of you. <laughs> This is going to be fun. That's enough. That's enough. Okay. If you're joining us at one of the campuses or online, wherever you may be, I want to give a special shout out to my man Will Mines and his family. Live outside the D.C. area. They started watching with us online during COVID about a year ago. They thought, man, what are we doing here? We so love. This church, we should just move to Mount Pleasant and be a part of it. How many of you are excited to be a part of a church where people will move from across the country to be a part of the move of God? He's doing here, isn't that special? All right, all right, all right. That's enough. <laughs> hey, do I got any People's Court fans? Any of you watch it back in the day? There we go. A couple people. Man, it has been on for decades now. Some of my favorite episodes were from the '80s and '90s with Judge Wapner. Y'all remember him? Sassy dude. They'd bring in somebody, a plaintiff and a defendant. Dun, dun, dun. Got the music going. They'd give a nickname to the case, nicknamed them. They'd present the evidence. Wapner would cast a verdict. People would be in there like two minutes, and he's talking about, "I don't believe a word is coming out of your mouth." I'm like how? You've only known them three minutes. I'm like why? You know? They go in. He casts a verdict. Then they would walk out into the hall and talk with my man Doug Llewellyn. Where he would say, "How did you feel about that? You didn't do too well, you know." And interview him and send him off. I was all excited, man. I geeked out on YouTube for probably an hour. I ordered this gown. It came in the mail. I did adult judges gown size 42. It came in. I put it on. I was expecting it to feel more like significant. Well, man, I feel like I copped this thing off an eighth grader after graduation. <laughs> like, what is this? <laughs> right? This is not what I had in mind, right? I spent at least an hour watching these old episodes. My favorite of which was this boyfriend and girlfriend used to be so close, but now they were estranged, didn't talk with each other, and she was suing him for three hundred and eighty-seven fifty because he had let her use her mobile gas credit card, and he had racked up three months worth of gas, three hundred and eighty-seven dollars and fifty cent. I was thinking, I can barely drive to the Columbia campus and back for three hundred and eighty-seven dollars. <laughs> like what in the world? So she was suing for that. Plus five hundred dollars in punitive damages because the debt weighed over her. It was just so so stressful, right? So I'm enjoying watching this episode, but then I started pulling back from it for a minute to think, man, how crazy is it that two complete strangers, like the judge, didn't know these people. He didn't know their stories, their character, and whether or not he's able to, to discern between truth or good or bad is dependent upon one their ability to just communicate. Which is difficult in and of itself on national television. Whether or not they brought all of the appropriate paperwork, receipts, if they're going to be able to to prove their case, and Judge Wapner's got to do it all between six and eight minutes and commercials on national television. <laughs> I'm like, man, good luck with that. Well, it makes for good TV, and as long as there have been people, there have been the need for judges, someone to dispute between parties to help them discern what's true or not. There's a lot about court TV that also parallels our lives and friendships. There's the unexpected drama of relationships, disagreement among friends, somebody in the right, somebody in the wrong. How many of you know you don't need court TV to experience any of that? It is real life. Any of you agree with me on that? Man, all of us deal with it, and it's our tendency to position ourselves as judge and jury when it comes to sentencing others, to trying to discern what is the truth. We live in a day where it is way too easy and tempting to judge people, regardless of whatever social media platform you're on or or use Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter. You can be laid up on your couch all alone at the house, sitting in your car, or on vacation, and pull up somebody that lives in your community or on the other side of the world, and look at the people that they hang with, the decisions that they make, and within just a few minutes, you can feel relatively certain in your judgment and assessment of them. Well, judging others has been an issue for as long as there have been people. Wherever there's a multitude of people, there's also a multitude of perspectives and persuasions, and a need to determine what is right, wrong, good, or bad. It was true in Jesus' day, and it is especially true in ours. For the last six months, we've been looking at the the Sermon on the Mount. We've got about four weeks left in doing so, but this week we're going to be in the beginning of Matthew chapter seven, where Jesus offers us. Uh, several thoughts on judging 
others. This passage is one that's largely probably most known by people that are not believers and are unfamiliar with the Bible, and it's likely one that's most ignored by believers. It starts in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. It says this, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred and do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under feet and turn and tear you to pieces. So what can we learn from Jesus on judging others based on this text? I'm so glad you asked. Several thoughts for us. The first of which is be careful how you judge. Be careful how you judge. What did Jesus mean by do not judge? At face value and out of context, this is where most people would just stop with the scripture. But it's one of those that if you don't look at the entirety of scripture to best understand what Jesus means, that you could miss the point entirely. For example, just a few verses later in Matthew 7, verses 15 and 16, this is a passage we're going to look at in a couple weeks, but we see Jesus say, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. He says, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Man, that sounds an awful lot like a judgment call to me. See, at some point, we as believers need to be able to evaluate those that are in in our lives, the people that they hang with, the decisions that they make, and based on their relationship to us, see what kind of influence is that having on me, or what kind of consequences is it bringing about in their lives? We need to be a people who exercise good judgment, but we ought not be a people who are judgmental. And so the question becomes, well, how do we best discern between the two? Well, the English word judge comes from the Greek word krino that translates largely as we understand the word. It means to pronounce an opinion concerning right or wrong, or to pronounce judgment. And it's that word pronounce where we largely get in trouble, in part because of verse 2. Jesus told us, for with the same measure, same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So if we pronounce someone as wrong or guilty or deserving of hell or not deserving of heaven based on their works, Jesus is saying, be careful because I'll judge you by your works as well. In other words, he's saying, if you judge someone by their works, it is not going to work out too well for you. Why is that? Because our works are a good indicator of our faith. James tells us that faith without deeds, without works is dead. Our works is a good indicator of our faith, but by themselves, our works don't prove anything. When we judge other people based on their works, the choices that they make, addictions that they have, habits that we see them live out, when we judge them based on those things, we belittle the price that Jesus paid on the cross. So he said, don't just judge other people by their works. The danger in judging is that oftentimes we don't know. We don't see the whole story. In John 7, 24, Jesus was having a debate with teachers at the festival of tabernacles and about what was lawful on the Sabbath. And in verse 24, Jesus says to them, stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. This is one example of eight or nine different ways that we can judge incorrectly in Scripture. A handful of them I picked out just for us to look at because we tend to struggle with them the most. The first of which is superficial judgment. This is the one Jesus just referenced, and it's when we pass judgment on someone purely based on their appearance. In Luke chapter 7, Jesus goes to the house of Simon the Pharisee, and there's a woman in that town who lived a sinful lifestyle. And when Jesus goes to Simon's house, that woman shows up. And from the time he walks in the door, she's sitting at his feet, crying and and kissing his feet. All the while, Simon the Pharisee is thinking, man, if Jesus was really a prophet, he would know the sinful life this woman had lived, and he would not allow her to be sitting at his feet, crying, kissing his feet, all this stuff. Well, knowing what was going on in Simon's heart, Jesus speaks to it and says, Simon, from the time I walked in your home, you didn't do anything for me, but this woman has yet to stop weeping at my feet. And he tells Simon, because she has been forgiven much, She loves much. Jesus is warning us here like, hey, if you judge simply based on appearances, you're seldom going to get it right. That's one way that we judge incorrectly. Another one is hypocritical judgment. That's when we point out the sins 
of others, all the while we ourselves are struggling with sin. Romans 2, 1 says, you therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same thing. The example that comes to mind for me here is of the woman who was caught in the act of adultery. Religious leaders catch her in the act. They bring her before Jesus in front of crowds, throw her on the ground, and the law would say that she is deserving of death, upon which Jesus squats down, writes in the sand for a moment, and then says, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. It's important to note that he didn't say, let he who hasn't committed adultery cast the first stone. But one by one, her accusers left until finally Jesus said, woman, where are your accusers? She said, well, they've all gone. And he said, well, then neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And what Jesus did in that moment was he held up the reality of her sin that was adultery, deserving of death. And he didn't tell the religious leaders they were wrong in their assessment, but he asked, do any of you have sin in your life? Let you cast the first stone. He put those two sins on a level level playing field. And oftentimes, Man, we can be quick to see and judge the sin of others. All the while, we are battling sin in our own life as well that we've yet to deal with. That's hypocritical judgment. He says, man, don't do that. Another is harsh or unforgiving judgment. That's when we have a rude or disrespectful tone and or no desire to restore the relationship when we're addressing the sin of someone else. Titus 3, 2 says, always be gentle towards everyone. Matthew 5, 7 says, it is the merciful who will be shown mercy. If our desire in addressing someone's sin is to put them in their place or to remove a person or problem from our life, then there's a good indicator that it may not be the best of motives, that it could be harsh and unforgiving judgment. Another is self-righteous judgment. When we're overly confident or prideful of our position and comparing it to others. There's an example of this in Luke 18, 9 through 14 that we read, to some who are confident of their own righteousness, Jesus looked down Uh, To some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, Clemson fans, or even like this tax collector. (laughs) I'm just kidding. Maybe not. I don't know. We'll see. All right. (laughs) I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Man, these are just a handful of a number of different examples in Scripture of ways that we can judge incorrectly. Do you recall a time where you've ever judged someone incorrectly? Or maybe the other side of that coin, you've been judged incorrectly yourself. When Katie and I lived in Columbia, uh, we had a handful of rental properties. We'd buy a small house and I'd fix it up, do the handyman stuff, and then we'd rent it out and move on to the next one. And we had some tenants in this, this property and they called me one morning and said, hey, we just had a big chunk of the ceiling fall out in the hallway and there's water coming down. We think there's something wrong with the water heater. And I was like, you think? You know, like <laughs> there's water in the hall. There's definitely something. So I get over there and the front and back door had key locks and, and they had both the keys. And so I'm walking around. I look down a window that goes down the hallway. I can see the mess. I'm like, oh gosh, what do I do? Well, I found a window. One of the hall windows was unlocked and I slide it open. I call them, say, hey, if you come home, please open a door so I don't have to keep carrying all my tools in through the window. This is weird. Uh, I kept leaving voicemails. I go up in the attic, figure out the part that was needed that came loose, sent them a picture. Hey, I'm going to run to Lowe's. I go get the part. Hey, I'm back at the house. I'm going up. I fix it, clean it up. I call them like, hey, it's fixed. I'll be back to fix the sheetrock later. Don't worry. And so I get home, which was about 45 minutes away. About the time I'm pulling in the driveway, I get a call from these girls, hysterical. We just got home and all of our jewelry is gone and our laptops are gone. Our Sega Genesis is gone. You know, like they're talking to I'm like, oh my gosh. Okay, well, I'll be, I'll be right back. I'll head back that way. I get there. There's cop cars there. You know, it looks like a, a legit scene. I'm like, man, I am so sorry. This is awful. What can I do to help? And the cop was like, well, you can just come down the station in the morning, take this polygraph for you. We can clear you. And I was like, of course, absolutely. So I drive down. Next morning, having never taken one of those, they hook all this stuff up to you and sit down in the chair. And they're like, Mr. Walters, have you ever stolen anything? Like, yeah, yes. Like, 
In third grade, I stole a Bart Simpson pen. In fifth grade, I stole a box of Major League Baseball pencils. I'm like going, ever stolen anything? Like, I, I think that's it. I don't, you know, and so I'm answering all of his questions, sure that I'm doing it wrong. We finish the test, and we're in this small little room, no windows. He gets up from the table and drags his chair, metal legs across the concrete, sits it in front of the door and looks back at me. And well, Mr. Walters, the evidence speaks for itself. You're a pastor. Finish this statement for me, for me. The truth will. And he was wanting me to say, set you free. But I said, you are out your mind. Like, <laughs> I didn't do nothing wrong. Is this how it happens? I've seen one too many episodes of Law and Order to know that you just go wrongly, accuse me and lock me up. Am I arrested? And he's like, no. But I was like, well, I'm out of here. I'm not doing you know, like, what is this? And so for the next week, I might as well have been arrested because I lived in captivity. Every window I walked by, I was looking out to see if there are cop cars, because if there was, I was running out the back door. I'm being wrongly accused of this nonsense. We would be in church, and I just knew I'm up here presenting the gospel. Cops going to walk in and arrest me in front of all my students. We're going to be on date night at Olive Garden. I'm getting a never-ending salad bowl. It's going to be the last salad I ever have, because y'all cart me out of here. Like, just terrified, right? Well, about a week goes by, and somebody was breaking in another house in that neighborhood. Dude was going around the neighborhood, pushing up windows that he could pop open. And he broke in a home and it happened to be the home of a cop. Dude went Chuck Norris on him, locked him down. They arrested him. And he got a little bit of a lesser plea by owning up to all of the homes in the neighborhood that he had broke in and giving the items back, one of which was our home. So they just called me up. Hey, Mr. Walters, we just want to let you know we apprehended the criminal. Like, yeah, you did. <laughs> it wasn't me. I was going to lay hands on some of y'all. That wasn't me, you know, like, or whatever. But it's like, man, we know that there can be devastating consequences when we judge someone incorrectly in a court of law. But I would argue that the same could be said for when we incorrectly judge one another. We put people in a box. We label them because of their sin. We judge them, remove or separate ourselves from them. When God has called us to establish the kingdom of God within our relationships, within each other, that we might love one another well and not fall victim to the path that our culture wants us to walk in judging one another. We have got to be careful because it's so easy to do it incorrectly. The question then becomes is how do we do it correctly? And that's where Jesus goes next. So number one, got to be careful. But number two, I've got to start with me. Start with me. He goes on to say in verses three, through five, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye. Then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Man, this is a funny picture that he paints here, because oftentimes, if you ever had a speck of sawdust in your eye, like from the outside, you can't see it in someone else's eye unless they're like blinking, rubbing their eye, complaining about it. But even for somebody that had a speck of, of sawdust in their eye, if you were going to help them, it's like, man, is there anything more tender than removing something from someone's eye? Like they've got their eyelids pried open and you're, you're all close. They can smell the tacos on your breath you had for lunch. Like it's super intimate, right? And you're like, all right, look, look up, look, look to the left. Look down. Oh, there it is. There it is. You know, like, it's like you go to touch their eyes. Like, don't touch my eye. You know, like, go wash your hands. Maybe you might, you might can touch a little part and get it out of their eye. You bring a bowl of water and you try to flush it out of their eye. It can be dangerous, but a log in your own eye, man, you couldn't even help a brother get anything out of their eye. If you acknowledged you have a log in your own eye and it would take two hands to pull that thing out. That is some hard work. So here's the question. Why are we so prone to seeing and judging others before addressing our own issues? I've heard it said that what's appealing is revealing, meaning that the things that we desire, things that we long for or go after, that ultimately they say something about us. For example, if professionally you've bounced around from job to job to job in the last few years, going from pay raise to pay raise to pay raise, and you've been chasing the dollar at some point, it's important to ask why. What's appealing is revealing. Is it a certain amount of money that I need? Is it a status thing? Is this in some way connected to my identity? What's appealing is revealing. Why am I running after this? Well, the same can be said when we're tempted to judge others. When you sense judgment rise up in you, when you have those thoughts about someone else, it can be very revealing of something that's going on inside of you. Carl Jung, who founded analytical psychology and was one of the first experts in the field, 
to explore the religious nature behind psychology, said this. Thinking is difficult. That's why most people judge. Knowing your darkness is the best method for dealing with the darkness in others. Although our conscious minds are avoiding our own flaws, they still want to deal with them on a deeper level. So we magnify those flaws in others. So starting with me is all about getting familiar with my flaws, being aware of and dealing with my sin before I take the steps of addressing or dealing with the sin of others. So practically speaking, what does it look like to start with me? I've got five different steps that you can take, all of which are very basic. But as we talk through, I want you to be asking yourself, is there one of these that I tend to step over or not give enough time to? First of which is to begin with prayer. Psalm 139, 23 and 24 says this, search me, God, know my heart, test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of the everlasting. Is there any offensive way in me? God knit you together. He numbered the hairs on your head. He knows you better than you know you. Say, God, show me. Is there stuff in me that's leading to death, sin that I need to deal with? So number one, step one, begin with prayer. Second step is to confess my sin. First John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. God is faithful to forgive us of our sin, but we have to confess it to him. We have to ask for forgiveness. Third step we can take is to share my sin. God is the one who forgives me of it, but oftentimes it's in sharing it with a friend that I overcome it. James 5, 16 says, therefore, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Man, when you confess your sin to a brother or sister, when you tell them something that you've been secretly struggling with, man, it brings about a sense of humility and vulnerability in you that's going to be needed if you want to confront someone else in love. So we confess it to God. We can share it with a friend. The fourth step we can take is to start dying to my flesh. Whenever we confess that stuff to a friend or ask God for forgiveness, it's often not a one and done. It's going to be a struggle with sin. Luke 9, 23 says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and the key word daily, take up his cross daily and follow me. I've got to learn to start denying our flesh. Remember what's appealing is revealing. What are the things that we're going after with the desire that we want? And what is the story those things tell? We can start dying to our flesh. And then the fifth step is to live out the truth. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Now, all five of those steps are very basic, but what I love about each of them is that you can't just knock them out on a date night. You can't do it over the course of the weekend. And oftentimes when we feel judgment rise up in us towards someone else, that's how we want to deliver it. We want to just bring it to them. We want to say the thing. We want to remove the problem, address the person. But when he's saying, start with me, it's like, man, this is going to take time. For me to come to God in prayer, for me to own the things he reveals to me, for me to confess those, for me to muster up the courage to share them with a friend, for me to walk the road long enough that I die to my flesh, that I deny myself, that I start applying God's truth in my life. I want you to get a feel for the amount of time that would go by in order for you to do that long before you address the sin of a brother, just to help ensure my attitude and my motives are right. So we've got to be careful in how we judge. We've got to start with me. The third thing that we can learn from Jesus on this text is that we've got to give the good stuff to the right people. Give the good stuff to the right people. In verse six, he goes on to say, do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under feet and turn and tear you to pieces. The question that comes to mind for me here that the text doesn't speak to directly is who are the dogs and the pigs? We know in Philippians 3, 2, that dogs are equated with evildoers. Another question there would be, who let the dogs out? <laughs> Actually, would it be a question? Because it was you, you, you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's 90s rap, boy. I'm telling you, it'll bless you. We know that Philippians 3, 2 says that dogs were equated with evildoers. And we know that in Jewish culture, that pigs were unclean. So most scholars believe that the dogs... And the pigs were people who had rejected the kingdom of God, people who were committed to living an unclean life. And to to further interpret that text, neither dogs nor pigs have a shepherd, right? They have an owner, someone that's raising them up to fulfill their own purposes or preparing them for the slaughter. 
But we as the people of God are referred to in scripture as sheep who have a good shepherd, right? He's leading us to places of rest and provision. He loves us to where when we're in need or trouble, he would leave the 99 to go after the one. So what he's warning us here in this text is don't give to dogs what is sacred. Don't throw your pearls among the pigs. When we overly criticize people who aren't in the family of God, we run the risk of not only repelling them and turning them away, but finding ourselves bitter and angry as well. But man, when they are in the family of God, when I've done the work of starting with me, then scripture lays out a process that I can follow to ensure that I restore the relationship, that my motives are to restore the brother or sister in Christ. It's found in Matthew chapter 18. It says, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. But if they refuse to listen, even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. See, it lays out a process for us as the family of God, because we're all going to struggle with sin. And we all have blind spots. There are sin nature and, and ways in me that are hurtful to people that I don't see. That's why it's called a blind spot. But scripture tells us that the wounds of a friend can be trusted. Each of us desperately need each other to help us see the things that we can't see, to love each other in a way that Jesus would. But that can only happen when we decide that I'm going to be extremely careful when I judge. And the person that I'm going to judge first is me. I'm going to do the hard work of addressing, repenting, confessing, sharing, applying the truth so that when I come and talk to you, you might feel the humility. You might feel the kindness of the father. We've got to be careful how we judge. We've got to start with me. We've got to give the good stuff to the right people. And in preparing for the message this week, I thought a lot about the one person that I incorrectly judged most, and that was my dad. He, in every way, was my hero. I grew up hearing him say, I love you, I love you, I love you, till it just sounded like white noise all the time. You know, I love you, I love you. No, Dad, I know you love me. He never missed a, a sporting event. Well, even when he was transferred, he was in Camp Lejeune, we were still in Columbia. He would drive home on a Wednesday night to watch me ride the bench, right on a baseball game, just so I knew my dad supported me and was going to cheer me on. Somebody laughed at me riding the bench. That ain't funny. <laughs> I might have been injured. Oh, you tried to blame it on the kid. Don't point that. (laughs) Anyway, he wanted me to know that he loved me and he supported me. Well, the year before my dad passed away, uh, his dad passed away, Papa. And I learned some things about my dad that I didn't know. I learned that my dad was an all-American football player in high school, but Papa, when he was growing up, was an alcoholic. And Papa never came to a game, never saw my dad play football at that level. Uh, my dad didn't hear Papa say, I love you until the year that, that he died. And so I just can't imagine growing up, not feeling championed by a parent, not hearing I love you from a dad. So my dad overcame that, said, my son is going to know that I love him and he's going to know that I support him. And so I grew up hearing that all the time. Well, my freshman year of high school, when I accepted Christ, I just felt this shame because I had kind of been a fraud in some ways, drinking and driving and messing around. I was a good kid, like a respectable kid. Parents would have thought highly of me, but I had a way of managing that when they weren't around and getting buck wild, you know? And so I wanted to own all that. Just tell him the things that I had done, that I wasn't always who he thought I was. And I remember going over to their house and sharing all of those things and him knowing all of it. In fact, dad shared some things with me that I had forgotten to confess. I was like, you're right. right, I did. I did that, you know? And I remember leaving their house that night, this passionate, 18 year old kid that was like on fire for God thinking like, man, Jesus came from the father, full of grace and truth. And for all these years, you've been saying, I love you. I love you. I love you. Yet not once did you confront me with any of that sin. Like who knows what could have happened to me? And right then in my heart, I just judged him. That's not even real love. I said, you loved me all these years. You'd never even heard it or saw it modeled. Did you really know what love was all the while I'm trying to pursue the love of God? Well, this week in preparing for the message, God helped me learn from my dad yet again because I realized my dad was all too familiar with his darkness. Granny and Papa moved away his junior year of high school, and he finished out high school all by himself. Couldn't afford a car, rode a bike to and from school, feeding himself. He was in the Marines for 24 years, saw and experienced things 
he couldn't even speak of for decades. And here I was, this high school kid worthy of judgment. He had every right and opportunity to give me exactly what I deserve, yet he chose to love me. I thought, man, how would things have been different if I would have felt the judgment of the father and not the unconditional love of a father? And here now in this season of life, my tendency is to do often what we experience in culture and to judge people, to size them up, to give them what they deserve. I'll find myself driving home, having thoughts about people, things they've done or haven't done and what I think about that. Church, what would it look like as a people if we weren't so quick to judge people, even when deserving of it, but that we might leave them encountering us marked by the love of God, marked by the kindness of God, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, that he so loved you and I, that he sent his only son to die on the cross for our sins, not to come and bring the judgment upon us that we deserved, but to come and set us free that we might overcome sin. Church, if we won't follow the way of culture, in this way, if we will lead countercultural, if we'll lead with love, man, how might God use us? But we've got to be careful how we judge. We've got to start with me. And we've got to do the third point that I can't remember. But you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> All right. Let me pray for us. God, I thank you so much for this text. And um, man, I'm thankful that years later, at the place that is the most tender for me, and thinking about the passing of my dad, that you would continue to use him to teach me of your love and kindness. I'm so thankful for his example, for how marking it is on me, that he never judged me as my father, but loved me unconditionally. And I pray for each of us here today. I know that today is a day of destiny for many in this room, that if they were honest with themselves, when they envision your countenance with their eyes closed, that they see eyes of judgment and eyes of anger, that you're frustrated with them and disappointed in them, but here on this Pentecost Sunday, the day that represents when the disciples receive the gift of your spirit, I just pray that you would dump truck them with your love, that they would feel how crazy you are for them, that they wouldn't leave today without the script being flipped in some way, that they would see you for who you really are and that it would set them free. So now with every head bowed, with every eyes closed, if you would say that, you know what, I've always seen God kind of that way towards me, that he's judging me, that he's angry, but I want to receive his love today. I want to step into a relationship with him here in Mount Pleasant and all of our campuses. Would you just raise your hand for me? Amen. Just raise your hand. I want to pray for each of you. God, I thank you so much for every hand that's gone up today. And I pray that today, that that countenance of anger, of frustration, of judgment, would be one of great joy and love that when they think about you, that they would see the eyes of a father that so loved them that he would, he would go to every length to ensure that they might live in a relationship with you, that they would receive the gift of your Holy Spirit, believing that you died on the cross, that you conquered the grave, that we might overcome sin and have a relationship with you. God, help us to be a people that are not quick to judge. Even among a, a culture where it seems so easy and we are so justified in doing so. Help us be a people who are known by our love. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen, amen. amen.